It's just good to be here and to be able to hear y'all sing. That's very, uh, been very encouraging for me just to be able to hear y'all. And so uh, let's, we continue to worship. Let's just go ahead and read God's word again. And this is from uh, the reading that we've been doing so, so far. And so we're in Numbers 14, one through three. And, uh, and then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and that's the Israelites, and the people wept that night. And then all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back into Egypt? And so time and time again, we see the Israelites doubt God. They lose their faith. And so for that, they miss out on the, all the blessings that God has for them. Right. They had just forgotten all the great things that God had done for them. They had seen miraculous signs and wonders. God had, was constantly descended upon them in the form of a cloud, and he guided them by pillar of fire. So may we continue to never lose sight of the great things that God has done in our life, that we may use those great things to, fit, uh, to fuel our faith as we continue. So would you all just continue to worship with me as we sing great things.
just sing as we sing about the goodness of God. And I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my So Matthew 17, 17 through 20, uh, God's word says this. And Jesus answered, oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And so Jesus brings this boy with a demon and then Jesus rebukes the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So we can just continue to rest in God's faithfulness this morning. I am holding on to faith. Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it I will 
the darkest night you can light it up and you can light it up oh god of a revival let hope arise and death is overcome you've already won oh god of a revival you rose in victory and now you're seated forever on your throne so why should my heart fear what you've defeated i will trust in you alone because there's no prison wall you can't break through no mountain you can move all things impossible and there's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can save. All things impossible, the darkest night. And you can light it up, and you can light it up. Oh, God of a revival, let hope arise, and death is overcome. You've already won, oh God of a revival. Come awaken your people, come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people, come awaken the city. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out. Pour it out in the darkest night. You can light it up, and you can light it up. Oh, God of a revival, let hope arise, and death is overcome. You've already won. Cause there's no broken body you can raise, no soul that you can save, all things impossible. <clears throat> just a side note, I was talking to Katie, and I was just telling her, I said, man, listen to the worship. And we threw Josh into a very difficult situation in the sense we don't call him and say, Josh, you just come and sing. Well, a lot of people can do that. But you say, man, Josh, you got to come, and you got to build the worship around our reading. Man, you've got to build everything that we do about what we are reading this week in the Word of God, what we are studying in Sunday school, what we are preaching about. Then you come and prepare our hearts that we might understand and be affirmed in what we're reading. And, man, Josh, A+, plus, A+, plus, A+. Plus. Man, you did it. Thank you. And uh, so it's not just inviting somebody to come and sing and just, you know, play the guitar. No, man, we're inviting somebody to get into the Word of God with us and bring that Word back out of what we have read this week. Amen? And so, man, we're grateful for that. In our reading this week, we've been studying about a crisis of faith, a crisis of faith. We find that there was a ship out in the ocean. And they found themselves in a crisis of faith. They ran out of water. They had no fresh water. And they knew they were going to die. <clears throat> the salt water couldn't sustain them. And even though they had water all around them, man, they needed fresh water. And Man, in the moment of despair, they, they look out across that ship and they were able to see another ship. 
and threw signals of flags. They signaled the other ship and said, we need water. And the ship that they signaled to signaled back, and they said to them, said, man, lower the buckets. And the ship was thinking, no, I know there's water there, but we need fresh water. And so they signaled back again to the ship and said, man, what we are needing is fresh water, or we can't survive. And the ship again signaled back and said, let down your buckets. And what they didn't realize, that they were at the mouth of the Amazon River. And for miles at the mouth, <clears throat> the fresh water pushes back the salt water. And there was enough there for them to survive. It was a moment of crisis for them. But sometimes in our lives, we find ourselves in the same situation as those on the ship. We find ourselves at a faith crisis moment, a faith crisis moment of whether we're going to see and live by our sight, by our emotions, or are we going to live by faith? And we find that we are challenged by that all the time. As family, as individuals, are we going to live by faith or are we going to live by our own emotions? The Bible tells us, it tells us in the Word of God, that God is pleased by what? Faith. For the Bible says, without, say it with me, faith, it is impossible to please God. And we find ourselves today in our reading, in a crisis of faith, the children of Israel have come to a very pivotal time in their history and now they're going to have to decide whether they're going to live by their emotions, by sight, by their feelings, or whether they're going to live by the faith that they have in the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you would, and we find ourselves in Numbers 13, beginning with verse 17. Mark did a tremendous job on the lesson today, teaching us about grumbling. And we find today that they had... a time of a crisis of faith in their life. Notice what happens in Numbers 13, beginning with verse 17. We're going to read a pretty good long section, and I'll try to, to keep you posted where we're at. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, go up there into the Negev, and then go up into the hill country, and see what the land is like. And whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, or whether there are few and many, and how is the land in which they live? Is it good or is it bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they open camps or are they with fortification? And how is the land? Is it fat or is it lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to go some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zen as far as Rehob at Lebo Hamath. And when they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron. Man, you ought to circle that in verse 22. Circle Hebron in your Bible. We'll come back to that later. Very important. Where Ammon and Shishai and Telmah and the descendants and Anak and now Hebron was built seven years before Zon in Egypt. And there they came into the valley of Eskel. And from there they came down and a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two men and some pomegranates and the figs. And the place which they call Eskel because of the cluster which the sons of Israel came down from there. We're in verse 25. And when they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to the congregations of the son of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back the word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told them and said, We went into the land where you sent us. And it certainly, notice these words, man, it certainly does 
flow with milk and honey. This is the fruit. Man, they're saying that everything that God said is correct. But notice what it says in verse 28. But nevertheless, the people who live in the land are what? Strong and the cities are fortified and are very large. And moreover, there's all the sinners and Anak there. And Amalek is living in the land of Negev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites, and in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people. You could see it. Man, you could feel the tension here. Quieted all the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome But the men who had gone with him said, We are not able to go up against the people. A crisis of faith, right? Men, we're not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone, in spying it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people who saw it and are the men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the son of Anak, or the part of the Nephilim, and which became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. What is it that we are to do as Christ followers when we have a faith crisis? When we are bumped up against those times in our life when fear, discouragement, despair, circumstance come against us, what is it that we are to do to be successful, to honor God when we have a moment of a faith crisis in our life? Listen, my friend, the first thing that we are to do, we are to take hold of the promises of God. Moses led now the children of Israel to this point in time. They are the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And now they're ready to go into the promised land. Man, they're excited. It's been 400 years that they've lived in Egypt. And part of that time they were in slavery. And now they're ready on the brink to go into the promised land. Man, you could only imagine the excitement, the hunger of the people. But why were they so excited? Well, you say, man, that's obvious. Man, they get to go in the land. But there's much more than that. Much more than that of why they were excited. First of all, man, they were excited to take hold of the promise of God, first of all, because it was the land that God had promised for the Jews. Man, don't get wrapped up in the television shows. Don't get wrapped up in the political affairs. I'm telling you. That the land of Israel is for the Jews. God has promised that to them. I know there was other people that lived there. I know there was other people that were there before them. But listen, God gave his word that the land of Israel is for the Jews. Listen to what it says in Genesis 13, 15. For all the land which you see, he said, I will give it to you and your descendants. Genesis 26, 3 says, Sojourn in the land. And he said, Man, I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands. And I will establish each with I swore to your father Abraham. Genesis 28, 13 and 14 again. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham. And the God of Isaac, and the land in which you uh, lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. And we find they were excited to go in the land because why? This was the land that God had promised them. This was the land that God said will be yours. And all they needed to do was take hold of the promise of God. But second, there was an excitement because there was freedom from slavery. Man, there was going to be great freedom in the land. No longer would they have a taskmaster over them. They they were going to be able to have their own home, their own dwelling. 
live before the Lord and rejoice before Him, man, it was freedom from slavery. And man, they were excited about that. But it's also rest from wondering. Rest from wondering. Can you imagine 40 years? That's about half of a lifetime for the average American. 40 years they, they wandered in the wilderness and just ate dust and, and wandered around. And the next day, if God moved the pillar or the cloud before them, they, they would just wander again. 40 years. We hear that, but let it sink in. And so the people are excited and said, now, man, we've got a place to rest. We've got a place to have a family, a home, a place to worship the Lord. Man, they were excited about that. But it's also a place of abundance from simplicity. Man, God was going to give them an abundant land. A land what? Flowing with milk and honey. Man, they were going to have an abundance of crops. God promised if they would stay faithful, he would bring rain. And he would bring abundance to their lives. If they would only be faithful. And so they were excited to have abundance. But also they were excited about diversity from the bland. Diversity. Man, they were going to have grapes and figs and pomegranates. They were going to have fish. But right now, what were they having? They were having the bland. They were having manna in the morning, manna for lunch, manna in the evening, manna for supper all day long. It was manna, manna, manna. Man, it was going to change. And man, they were excited of what God had for them. And what they simply needed to do in that moment of crisis Man, they needed to take hold of what God said that land was theirs. And then they just needed to go and proclaim it. Take it and live in victory already. But you know what we need to do? We find ourselves in a moment of crisis that we need to take hold of the promised land that is ours. What is our promised land? It is heaven. Charles Spurgeon said, you know what? He said, just imagine if somebody was leaving you a mansion on a, a lot of acres, but you couldn't have it. You couldn't take charge of it until the people that were living there has deceased. He said, man, if that was yours, what would you do? He said, man, you would drive around it. Man, you would want to look through the gates. You would want to know about it because that is yours. You would want to dream about it, spend their time. And you know what we need to do? We need to spend time claiming what is ours already in heaven. Just like the children of Israel, we need to find ourselves taking hold of the promises of God and saying, God, man, you have promised me heaven. Man, in John chapter 14, he says that he has given us heaven. And man, we need to claim it and live in that reality that heaven is ours, but also it's going to be a place of freedom. Man, don't you look forward to heaven? That man, no longer do you have to fight with sin, struggle with temptation, Find yourself with the infirmities of the body. Man, we're going to be free in heaven. But also heaven's going to be a place of rest. Now, we're not going to be sleeping all the time or playing a harp on a cloud. But man, we're going to be working for the Lord, serving the Lord in heaven, worshiping the Lord. But man, it's all going to be done in complete rest. How many of you got up this morning and you said, man, I'm tired already. I'm just tired, right? My famous saying is this, not so famous because nobody knows it except me, but I said, the world moves on the backs of tired men. But man, that's true. But I want you to know, man, in heaven, we will move with great rest in heaven. But not only that, we find it's going to be a place of great variety. I love Revelations when it says in Revelations 22, too, in the middle of its streets, on either side, a river will be flowing and the tree of life will be bearing, listen to this, 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were there for healing of the nations. Listen, man, it's going to be wonderful what heaven is. But I'm going to ask you, do you visit there very often? Man, do you hang out in heaven every once in a while? Man, it's good to do that. To hang out what is yours. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that you would want to? that God has already given it to you, that, that we need to hang out there and, and begin to think about what is mine, what it's going to be like, what I'm going to enjoy, what I'm going to celebrate. Man, 
When a moment of crisis comes to your life, a moment of a faith crisis, take hold of the Word of God. But second, there's something else you need to do. You need to claim the promises of God. How many of you are in a D group? Raise your hand right now. Raise your hand. Man, all across the balcony of the auditorium, one of the things that we're doing in a D group that you say, oh my, is the Scripture memory. Man, your leaders, man, they pin you against the wall every week. Man, what is that verse? What is that verse? Man, we need those verses in our minds, and our hearts, that when we are tempted in a, in a time, a crisis of faith, that we can call that Scripture out and claim it. Man, that's what the children of Israel needed to do. See, God led them. Led them right there on the edge. And Moses said uh, that they were to select 12 spies. Really not spies, because they weren't really spying the land. They were scouting the land. It was their land. It wasn't whether they were going to go in and take it or not. Man, it was just whether they were going to be able to view it, see it, and hear a report. And so they sent out the 12 scouts out to see the land. And they started in the south. And they went all the way up to the north and spied it out 40 days. And don't you know the people in the camp were waiting and wondering? Man, get back. Man, we want to hear about it. And they wondered what was happening, but they spied it out for that long. And I want you to notice Numbers 13, 2 what they needed to claim, what they needed to claim in their lives. In Numbers 13, 2, notice the words, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. When the 12 spies went out, man, they went out in that knowledge. They went out in that knowledge that God said, man, I'm going to give it to you. Man, every place that you tread your feet, every place that you go, when you go in the land spying, it's already yours I'm giving it to you. I'm giving it to you. But here's what I want you to notice. Notice uh, chapter 13, verse 22. And when they have gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron. I asked you earlier to circle the word Hebron. Because, man, this is encouraging. When they got to Hebron, what did they see? Man, they saw the tomb of Abraham. They saw the tomb of Sarah. They saw the tomb of Isaac. They saw the tomb of Rebekah. They saw the tomb of Jacob. They saw the tomb of Leah. Man, this should encourage their hearts. Man, this should have strengthened them. Man, they said, man, this is our land. Man, this is where our forefathers that God has promised have been buried, and now we are returning to claim and to take hold what is ours. But when they came back after 40 days, we find they were in unison. Man, it was a vote. It was 100%. Listen what they said. They said, man, it's everything that God said it would be. It took two men to carry a cluster of grapes back. They go, look at this. Man, this is just one cluster. They brought back pomegranates. They brought back figs. They they laid them out. And man, all the 12 spies were in unison. And they were saying, man, God's right. God's right. Man, it is great. Let's vote now. It'll be unanimous. Does a Baptist church ever have a unanimous vote? Somebody tell me. No, okay? Somebody on the search committee said, I don't think we've ever had a unanimous vote ever for a candidate. I'd like to see that change sometime. Amen? That, man, we would be unified. But here's what we find. They came back. They were in unison. But then notice with me verse 27 in chapter 13. Notice what they said. Thus they told and said, We went to the land where you sent us. And it, notice the words, it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Man, everything that God said is true. Man, God doesn't lie. God said it flows with milk and honey, and it does. And then they said, but. Man, that's a crisis of faith right there. Whenever you say, but God, man, that's a crisis of faith happening in our life. Notice verse 28. 
Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified, and a very large, and moreover saw the descendants of Anak were there. I remember as a young pastor, Thomas, Oklahoma. Man, we were walking out. We were in my office, just kind of having a, a last-minute rally. We were walking out to vote on building. Everybody was in unison. Man, we were ready. The church was ready. We were walking out to present it to the church, and somebody in the meeting said, nevertheless. Man, I, I, I about went through the wall. I, I couldn't believe it. The church is waiting. They've been in unity all this time, and one person began to spoke up. And you know what? You get one grumbler in the crowd. Somebody asks, well, you know what? And man, it went on. And so we postponed the meeting. And we postponed the meeting that was there. And we waited uh, just for a moment. Here's what I'm going to ask us to do, if we would, just for a moment. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads for a moment. And if we have a doctor in the room, a nurse in the room, we'd ask you if you would go to the back of the church for a moment. Let's the rest of us bow our heads just for a moment, if we would. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray right now that, Father, that you would give your help. And, Father, we pray that you would just be with our, our people and that, Father, you would provide the help that we need during this time. Heavenly Father, we pray and give ourselves to you and and we find, like the children of Israel right now, we turn to you and, and ask that, Father, that you would just do your work. And we pray this in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. And so we find in Numbers 28, man, the people cried, nevertheless. And I remember leaving that that time in my office, so discouraged, we came back and we voted and went through and we built. But what we find, there's always that crowd that said never last. And so we find that 10 of them, 80% of them said, man, never less. Man, we can't go in. We, we can't take it. And we find 20%, only two that said that we could. I want you to notice what happened and what the report was. Follow along with me in your Bibles. First of all, they doubted. Notice in 1331, notice what they said. We are not able. Notice how God is not a part of any of this. Notice the second thing they said. There was self-abasement in verse 33. They said, you know what? We are like grasshoppers. Man, we're small compared to to what those giants in the land are. The third thing, there was fear. Notice with me in Numbers 14, 9. They cry out and said, do not be afraid. They, they were fearful during that time. The fourth thing that we see, there, there was clamoring there. there. There was clamoring that was going on. They were grumbling. Mark in 14, 2. And then we find the fifth thing. Uh, there was a rebellion. Uh, they said, man, let us get our own leader in Numbers 14, 4, and let's return to the land. Now, if you add all these up, doubt and self-abasement and fear and clamoring and rebellion, what do you find? It boils down to this. It was just a spirit of unbelief. And in Hebrews chapter 3, 19, it causes, it causes this for what it was. They just didn't believe God. They just didn't believe God. And it was a spirit of unbelief. And they said, man, we just can't do it. They couldn't trust God. A crisis of faith. But I want you to listen to the report of the two men that had their eyes on the Lord. They responded, first of all, in faith. Notice what it says in 1330. It says, we are able to overcome said, man, we are able to overcome. Man, we can do it. And then they responded in confidence. And Joshua said in 14.9, the people are bread for us. I love that. <laughs> the people? Man, they're just like bread. 
Man, they're nothing to us. Man, we'll eat them up. They, they mean nothing. And then they responded in courage. In 14.9, Joshua said, fear them not. Wasn't it Truman that said the only thing that we have to fear is fear itself? This is what they were saying, man, there's no fear in this. And then they responded with passion. Caleb said, let us go up at once and possess it. They found themselves in a crisis of faith. What they were going to do. Were they going to listen to the information of the ten or to the two that were saying, man, let's trust God. Let's claim His promises. The sad thing is they listened to the majority. You understand that the majority is not always right. Somebody say amen. Even in the church, the majority is not always right. Because I want you to notice, look what it says in Numbers 14, 34. And according to the number of days in which you spied out the land, 40 days for every day you shall bear your guilt a year. Even 40 years and you will know my opposition. They failed to claim the promises of God. And sometimes in our own lives, when we find ourselves in the greatest crisis of faith, when we find ourselves in trouble, it's when we fail to claim the promises of God. It's when we fail to claim God's word. It's a crisis of faith. But thirdly, the reasons for a crisis of faith. What is the reason that these crises of faith come to our lives? What produces them? What brings them about? What, what causes a crisis of faith? In preparing for this message, I, I found something Charles Stanley did, and it's so good. He says, first of all, it's fear of failure. Fear of failure. When you're facing a crisis of faith, sometimes it comes when we are just fearful. You know, whenever fear enters our life, it pushes faith out. Listen to what I said. When fear enters your life, it pushes faith out. And we find in our lives at a time they were fearful in our lives. Second, we notice also there's false information. They listened to the ten. They listened to the 10 that gave false information that said, man, we can't do it. We can't go into the land. Man, be careful. Listen, be careful who you listen to. Man, don't listen to the grumblers. Don't listen to the complainers. Man, listen to the man. Listen to the woman. Man, that is filled with the Lord. Amen? Listen to those that are walking with the Lord, but they, they listen to bad information. Thirdly, Failure to recall the Lord's past, pal past power. Man, here they were, 18 months out of Egypt. 18 months out of Egypt. God has performed all these miracles. God has divided the sea. God has fed them the manna. And man, they now have forgotten all that God has done for them. And many times in our own lives, when there's a crisis of faith, it's because we never go back and, and begin to claim, man, God, you did this for me. God, you saw me through this time in my life. And God, if you did that, man, God, you're going to work in this instance. And then we find it's a failure to see the circumstances from God's perspective. Man, they were saying, man, there are giants in the land. Man, we're just grasshoppers. But God was saying, man, they're nothing but bread to you. They're nothing but bread to you. You can take it. And sometimes we focus so much on the circumstances that we push God out. And we say the circumstances are greater than God. Fifthly, focus on the obstacles rather than on the Lord. Men, all they could see were the fortified cities. All they could see were the strong men. But God was stronger. God was greater. And so we find any one of these or a combination of these five can bring you to a crisis of faith. So here's what I want to ask you today. What is your crisis of faith? 
even in the church. We could have a married man that is sitting here today, and his crisis of faith is, you know what, I'm going to end my marriage. Man, she didn't do a whole lot for me. She's not that great looking. She doesn't have meals cooked. She's not that uh, dressed up for me. And you know what? There's a lady in the office that meets all those needs. But you know what my heart says? It's the lady in the office is right. My emotion says the lady in the office is right. And you know what's happening to that man? And maybe it's you here today. It's a crisis of faith. Are you going to do it God's way and say, man, what God's word says? When he said we are to be faithful and true to our wives, are we going to do it our way? Or maybe for you, your crisis of faith is this. I've heard it in the church already. I've heard it among our people already. They said, you know what? We were like staying at home, watching on TV. It's easier. You know what? I'm not afraid of the COVID anymore. I'm not afraid of getting out. I just like staying at home. I can watch four messages. Why would anybody want to watch four messages? Just watch one and do it, right? You know, I mean, unbelievable. But you know what? I, I, I'd rather stay at home. I can drink my coffee, stay in my bathrobe. It's a crisis of faith. Are you going to allow your own desires, your own comfort, get in the way of God's Word when it says that we are not to forsake what? The assembly of ourselves coming together. It's a crisis of faith. For others of you, maybe it's, it's a crisis of infidelity. A crisis of infidelity, whether that's through porn or whether you're seeing someone right now. And man, you've got all the justifications why it should continue. Makes you feel good. You desire it. You deserve it. Man, it, it's the best. You work hard. But when you look in the Word of God, God says... It is sin. It is wrong. Maybe your crisis of faith is a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you know that you shouldn't be with. So I'm going to ask you today, what is your crisis of faith? What is your crisis of faith that you're dealing with right now that you're on the line? My friend, listen. Claim God's word. It's the right thing. It's the best thing. It's what God would want you to do. And my friend, you will be blessed for it. I love the song. It says, in Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. My friend, take hold of the Word of God Claim the Word of God, and listen, He will see you through the crisis of faith. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed right now, some of you are in a crisis of faith. Some of you right now are struggling right now in a crisis of faith. Do I do it God's way, or do I do it my own way? It might be in your marriage. It might be in your job. It might be an integrity issue. It might be with a boyfriend or girlfriend. But right now you're in a crisis of faith. So, so let me ask you. Man, are you going to take hold of the promises of God? Are you going to claim the promise of God? Forty years out in the wilderness. The wilderness of a breakup of a family. It's a wilderness of carrying guilt and shame. My friend, listen. Do it God's way. Do it God's way. Right now in your life, would you just lay it down and say, God, man, everything is pulling me the other way. Man, would you right now say, God, right now, I, I just put a stake down. God, I'm putting a stake down. I'm going to do it your way. God, I'm going to trust you. Even though my circumstances and even though everything around me says no, man, put it down and do it God's way. There's some of you here today that God has, man, been prompting to join this church. Man, you're putting it off. You say, you know what? Man, I don't know if I really need a church home. Maybe next month, next year, six months from now. Man, your family, your children, you 
need a church family. It's a crisis of faith for you. Man, you're going to do it God's way or are you just going to get mad? I'm just going to ease through life, cruise through life. Friend, it'll catch up with you. Man, everybody needs a church family. And there's some of you that are having a crisis of faith right now. You know God's calling you to surrender your life to Him. Man, you keep waiting. Man, I will if Tim will say something to me. I, I will if Tommy will say something to me. My friend, Christ has already spoken to you. Man, you get up from where you are in a moment. You come to the front. Tim will be here. I will be here. And man, say, man, Satan's not going to win today. Christ is going to win. I'm going to do it his way. Unashamed, I'm coming to Christ today. Some of you, God's calling to a special service. Some of you make God's calling to Christian ministry. Man, why don't you step out and say, man, I, I will receive that call. Don't put it off. In a crisis of faith, man, do it God's way. Heavenly Father, man, we face those times in our lives of those crises of faith that come along. Help us, Father, to be like Joshua and Caleb. To say, you know what? Yeah, it looks difficult. It looks hard. It looks daunting. But man, we're going to put our stake, our faith, our stock in God. And man, we're going to do it that way. So Father, we pray that you would have your will and way in this invitation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Let's stand and sing. Joshua, you lead us, please. what you say that you're good 